Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. We'll come back to Luke 11. Well, where do I get the title of my sermon? I get it from 1 Thessalonians 5, where the Bible says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Right? Pray without ceasing. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says pray without ceasing. This means that you don't need to be in a location. You don't need to be in a certain position to be praying to God. Right? You can pray, you can talk to God throughout all the day. Right? Pray without ceasing. Don't stop. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now prayer is something that every believer struggles to do. Why is that? Because prayer requires a lot of faith. Think about everything else in the Christian life requires you, you play some part, don't you? You want to learn more Bible, you can actually read more. You know, you go to church, you go and you know, preach the gospel, you can go talk to, you can actually take part in some things. But what is prayer? Prayer is when you, you it's something outside of your control and you are fully trusting somebody else, i.e. God in this instance, to do it for you, right? So this is why prayer requires a lot of faith because you actually, what you are doing is actually beseeching somebody else to do something for you because in most instances you are unable to do things yourself you need the strength to do things yourself so sometimes we when i think of prayer i think of this uh, man crying out to jesus you know when um, jesus heals his son he says here straightway i won't say the whole story but just this phrase here straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears lord i believe help thou mine unbelief. Isn't that sometimes you, like you're feeling when you pray? Like you believe, but you want God to help you to, to believe more. I right? help the fact that you don't believe as much as you should in terms of, you know, when you pray, you don't want to pray unstably, like a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, like it says in James. There's a funny story in Acts 12, and I've talked about it before, where, you know, you can see that even in the early church, people are praying and not even really believing what they're praying for, but God in his good graces still answers their prayer. Acts 12 verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So the church is gathering together, they're praying that Peter would be delivered from prison. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, <coughs> bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. So it's kind of like nudged him, right? And raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So this is something supernatural that's happening. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. He went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So Peter at this point is not really realizing that this is happening, right? That this supernatural prison at break is happening. Um, even as his, their chains come up and the angel is sort of taking him out of the prison. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. So this gate just opens by itself, right? And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So what do you think they're gathering together praying for? Right, they're gathering together, praying that Peter would get out of prison. Right? And as Peter, look, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So she hears Peter's voice and him knocking. She doesn't open it. She's like, oh, that's Peter. I'm going to go tell everyone that Peter's at the door. And they said unto her, look at this. So they're praying for Peter to get out of prison. Look at their response. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. So we use the word mad to mean angry. In the Bible it means you're crazy. Mad, you know, like you're mad. Are you mad? You're crazy. So they're saying, you're crazy. Crazy that their, their, their prayer has been answered. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And said they, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were shocked. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord 
had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So you can see here, even in the early church, in the gathering together, praying without ceasing. And then when it gets answered, they don't even believe when that prayer gets answered. Uh, when Rhoda tells them that Peter is knocking at the door. <clears throat> so just as an introduction, you can see how prayer is something that every believer struggles to do. So don't... Uh, be you know astonished or surprised if you struggle to pray as well i mean every believer struggles to do things that are spiritual but even more so prayer is something spiritual but like i said because you are fully trusting god to do something on your behalf and sometimes it's not easy to believe and sometimes we're like that father to jesus lord i believe but help thou mine unbelief that's sometimes a good prayer to have as well so I just want to talk about five things to do with prayer I'm just answer maybe some common questions and give you uh, maybe <laughs> dispel <coughs> a few misconceptions as well about prayer. So, you know, what is prayer? What, is, what does it actually mean to pray? Right? So there are different types of ways we talk to God. You know, there's thanksgiving, there's praising God. So thanksgiving is when you're just thanking God for something. Praising God is when you're lifting God up, you're telling Him how wonderful He is, and how great He is, and everything like that. But a prayer is actually when you ask for something. So if you want to be super technical about you know, what praying is, praying is when you ask for something from God. Right? So let's say you pray and you just give God thanks. You know, technically, that's not necessarily technically praying. Right? You're speaking to God and giving Him thanks, maybe praising Him. Prayer is when you're asking things from God. So you can see the, how the word is used in the Bible just when you see this phrase, I pray thee, right? I ask thee. Genesis 13, 7, here's an example between Abraham and Lot. And you know they had strife in the land and they had to separate. There was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle, and this is before his name was changed to Abraham, and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, so Lot is his nephew, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Abraham And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee. Right? He's asking him, I ask of you, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee. Again, I pray thee, I ask you, from me, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So this is very humble of Abraham to basically give Lot the first choice. And then we know that he looked towards the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. So he, you know, that's, there's a whole other sermon there about you know, um, Lot dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's what prayer means. So we can ask for things for ourselves when we pray, and we can ask for things for others as well, right? <coughs> so then sometimes the question is asked, you know, we, we believe in order to get saved, you call upon the name of the Lord. So I've been thinking about this question because we talked about it in this church before. We say like, well, isn't prayer, is prayer grace or is it works? Because if you say, well, you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, isn't that like a work salvation? Because when, I, when I'm commanded to pray and I'm praying, aren't I doing a work? Aren't I obeying God? So wouldn't that be work salvation? So the way I think it's distinguished is if you pray for something for yourself, that is grace, right? You're asking something for God. But usually when we are praying and God is commanding us to pray, usually the prayer we see in the Bible is praying for others, right? So that's where I think the distinction is. That's why when you ask for salvation, like the Bible says in Luke 11, we read this just this morning, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is of a father, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he give for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So this verse proves that if you ask for a gift, that doesn't all of a sudden make it works, right? Because some people will say, oh, you have to do something to get salvation. Isn't that work salvation? No, because there's, there's a distinction between me doing something for somebody else and me asking somebody to do something for me, right? If I ask somebody to do something for me, that's, that's me, that's the method in which I receive grace. But... If I am praying and beseeching on behalf of somebody else, now I'm, you know, doing a work for someone else, right? In the fact that I'm beseeching God on their behalf, 
right? Whereas if I beseech God on my behalf, that's me asking for grace from God. But if I'm working to ask for grace for somebody else, that's where I think the distinction is between praying. You know, praying is a work and praying is receiving grace. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, look at this, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So you can see how prayer is a good work. But I just want to make that distinction there where you don't want to get mixed up with, okay, well, we pray was salvation. Does that mean it's work salvation? No. Like, I think that's the distinction there. Asking for something for yourself, asking somebody else for grace for somebody else, right? You're not receiving that grace. You're actually doing the work in order to have somebody else do the get, get the grace, right? <clears throat> so, why do we pray? Why do we pray? Well, Matthew 6, just read here uh, with me. But when ye pray, use not rain, vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, we will look at the rest of Matthew 6 when we look at the Lord's Prayer a bit later. But I want you to notice that two verses before Jesus goes into the Lord's Prayer, that he says here, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. So what is that like? That's like your Buddhist chanting, you know, just saying the same thing again and again and again. And, you know, Christians do that with the Lord's Prayer, you know, where they just say things vainly again. I'm going to say my ten Hail Marys and do my rosary. And, you know, and then Jesus in Matthew 6 says, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And then what do they do? Then they take the Lord's Prayer and then they repeat that vainly, right? <laughs> just when Jesus said not to do that. Right? So we don't want to just... Prayer is not just a vain repetition of words. What Jesus says here, just because the more you say, you think the more you say, the more you're going to be heard. No. Right? So be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So isn't that interesting that God already knows what you're going to ask for before you pray for it. So you think, well, what's the point of praying then, right? Not... So prayer is not to let God know what your prayer is. Prayer is to show like how earnest you are in what you want, right? It's sort of like, you know, you may know that your kids want something, but then you might wait for them to ask for it to see do they, do they really want what they're asking for. You know, will they be persistent in what they want? Or is it just, you know, sometimes kids just ask for something, and then you just ignore it, and then they just forget about it. Later. You, so you didn't really want it. This is a passing thought, right? It's just, there's no filter between the brain and the, and the mouth. Like it just comes out, and then it's immediately forget about it. So it's the same here. It's like God knows what we want. God knows what we're going to ask for. But do we really want it? And this is where prayer shows the earnestness of our prayers. It shows God your earnest desire to have your request fulfilled. Right? Because if you're not praying for it, the question is, do you really want it? Do you really want it if you don't even want to ask God for it? Luke 11, verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you, and this is what we read this morning, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. So these are parables that you know, Jesus is using in order for us to learn about how prayer works with God. Right? For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, I have nothing to set before him. So one man has a friend traveling through, doesn't have any food, now he's asking his friend, like, give me something so I can feed my friend who's in, in this journey. And he from within, now this is the man's friend that he's asking for, so he from within answers, say, trouble me not, like, leave me alone, don't bother me. The door is now shut, my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee, right? So he's like laid, he's already sleeping, he's like, I don't want to get up, I'll give you something to eat, give you something so you can give your friend. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Isn't that interesting there? You would think that friends, <laughs> oh, that's why there's good friends and there's bad friends, right? Sometimes the familiarity can, you know, they say familiarity breeds contempt, right? Misery loves company. Sometimes when you're too friendly with people, too familiar with people, it's easier for them to reject you, right? But then when you're less familiar with people, you know, it's a, you, you tend to be more uh, accommodating. 
It should be the opposite way around, right? It says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, what is that? It's like his persistence, right? He will rise and give him as many as he needed. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The cool thing about this phrase here, you can see the first letter, ask, seek, knock, spells ask. Isn't that cool? Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That spells ask, so it's easy for you to remember. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So that's one example. Now there's another example. So this is a friend asking for food from his friend to give to another friend. And now we have the, you know, the parable of the unjust judge. So this is a different parable, but the same principle, and we are told a bit more information. Luke 18, verse 1, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So it's interesting that this parable is being told to us to, tell, to teach us why we should always pray. And what does it mean not to faint, not to give up, not to quit, not to stop asking for that prayer request that is, of course, according to the will of God, like we see in James, right? We don't want to ask things just to fulfill our own lusts, right? We're asking things that are, we know are according to the will of God, right? We don't want to faint. We don't want to quit. We don't want to stop saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. Right, so what is he saying here? This is, a, this is the, the parable of the unjust judge. He's a corrupt judge. He doesn't care what God thinks. He doesn't care what man thinks, right? He's, un, he's a corrupt judge. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Why, well, she wants justice. And he would not for a while, but afterward he thought within himself, But I fear not God, nor regard man. Yet because this widow troubleth me, right? This is the widow's importunity, right? His, uh, her persistence. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So this is what the unjust judge is saying. The unjust judge is saying, I don't care what God thinks to do what's right. I don't even care what man thinks to do what's right. I just want this woman off my back, right? She's just bugging me and bugging me. She's like a continual coming to me. It's just wearying me, right? And the Lord saith, hear what the unjudge judge, unjust judge saith. What are you saying? Listen to what this judge is saying, that if, if an unjust judge eventually does something because he's just bothered, he doesn't want to get bothered by somebody, he's saying, verse 7, and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him? though he bear long with them. Right, so he's saying, if an unjust judge is going to answer somebody's petition by their persistence, how much more will God answer our prayers by our persistence? Verse right, saying, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Right, so that's why prayer is something you must believe, right? Because it's not something you do. But we can see here, how, why do we pray? Again, it's to show our earnestness. That's why it's the importunity, the persistence. Do we really want what we are praying for? Well, that's how much you pray for is going to be a measure of how important it is to you. But the Bible gives us a parable here that if we continue to ask and not faint, God will answer our prayers in his time. The thing with prayer is, though, you know, sometimes when a prayer is answered, it's not always the answer you want. You know, so just because God answers the prayer, that doesn't mean he always gives you what he wants. Sometimes he gives you what you want, and it's, it's a bad thing. Um, I've often heard um, the story of Lot. We, we talked about Lot and Abraham. You remember Lot was in Sodom, and you remember Abraham petitioned God to not destroy Lot with the city, right? Remember how God, and God actually bargained him down, and, and God said, you know, if I find 50 to 10, and so he was actually saying, we found this many, and he started at 50, and then Abraham said, oh, 40, 30, 20, 10, will you spare the city? And God said, I won't destroy the city for 10 people. But remember, he didn't find 10. That's why the city was destroyed, but he spared Lot. But you sometimes wonder, you know, God gave Abraham what he wanted. 
But do you remember when Lot came out of Sodom, his daughters got him drunk, you know, and then slept with him. And the children of his daughters were Moab and Amnon, which was the tribes of the Ammonites and the Moabites. And they were a problem to Israel, right? So you kind of think, you know, was it actually good that Lot survived? Right, what you know, God gave because he, he was actually going to destroy all of the city, right? But because of Abraham, Lot was saved. But you know, was that good or bad? I mean, that's that's for God to know for us to find out one day, or, or it should have been the case. But interesting, nonetheless. So, so why do we pray? Show the earnestness of our prayer. Number three, how to pray. A lot of people, um, you know, maybe coming from different backgrounds, are taught different ways to pray, and you know, they haven't really you know, determine, you know, what's commandment and what's just tradition, like what are just, just practices that we see in the Bible and, you know, just a precedence, but not necessarily a commandment. Um, you know, the, the, the short of it is, you know, there isn't any commandment on how to pray, but we can look at different ways people pray in the Bible, and there is uh, a, a main way to pray, and actually when I was studying out this sermon and looking at it, a lot of people don't pray this way, <laughs> but maybe we should start to pray this way. Um, how to pray. Now, first we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer um, because the Lord's Prayer was in response to the disciples asking Jesus, teach us to pray. He says here in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So what I want you to think about as we read through this Lord's Prayer, it's very very uh, uh, familiar to us. It's known as the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually te- Jesus teaching people how to pray. Right? And when he's teaching people how to pray, he's not saying you have to say these exact things. He's just giving examples of things to pray for, right? So you can, you can get an idea of some things to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Um, even though it's known as the Lord's Prayer, it's actually Jesus teaching people how to pray. If you want to actually see Jesus praying, that's when you want to go like John 17, you know, John 18, where he actually prays with the disciples. And, um, you know, that would be more rightly called the Lord's Prayer. But this is um, known as the Lord's Prayer because he's teaching people how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So you can see part of prayer should be you know, acknowledging God and lifting up, praising him. And this is part of worship, right, in terms of lifting God up and telling God like how, how grateful you are for him and how great he is, how loving he is. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So it's another thing to pray for, that God's will is done in earth like it is done in heaven. And you know what? You can do that too. That's not something you have to pray for in terms of you doing what you know you should be doing, right? But we want God's will in general to be done on the earth. Give us this day our daily bread. So you can see that providing for us, right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this is talking about forgiveness and getting right with your fellow man, right? Forgiving others as you've been forgiving forgiven um, and also asking for forgiveness from God so we see here establishing good relationship this way as well as sideways and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil so protection from sin from the evil in this world for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen so we don't want obviously just want to repeat these things vainly Um, <clears throat> yeah, we don't want to just repeat these things vainly. I wanted to go to a passage in, um, in Acts, but I just forgot to put that into my notes. But you want to also recognize who you're praying to. You know, like I try and teach my children, you know, when we pray, because we, we have a sort of tradition in our family, like before we go to bed, we pray together, we just kneel around a table and we pray um, and I try and teach my children, you know, when we're praying to God, we, should, we shouldn't be mucking around, we shouldn't be laughing, because we should be respectful of who God is. I mean, we, we are beseeching the creator of the universe, and I think that's the mindset we ought to go with when we pray. So we want to teach our children that sort of mentality when we pray. We don't want them to muck around. We want, them to, we want it to be something serious. You know, even when they pray, you know, you want it to be serious as well. It's not something that we are joking about, you know. So some people ask, you know, like when we pray, 
Do we only address God? You know, some people say, like, you know, we pray in the Spirit to the Father, you know, through the Son. But, you know, to me, honestly, you know, I don't think it matters so much, these things, like who you address your prayer to, because, you know, they're all God. And even, I wanted to show you this verse in Acts 7, verse 59, where Stephen gets stoned and he actually calls upon God. He says, Lord Jesus, you know, receive my spirit. So he actually is addressing his prayer to Jesus directly. So there is precedence in the Bible for just us praying to God, you know, whether that's the Spirit, whether that's the Father, or whether that's Jesus. To me, it's all the same because it's three, three in one. But, uh, you know, here we are shown that we address our Heavenly Father. I think that's just one way we can pray. Like I said, this is not a script on how to pray. This is a, sort of like a guidance in different ways we can pray. That's how I understand the Lord's Prayer because obviously plenty of different things we can pray for, right? Now, other factors on how to pray. A couple of things that I think are less important is how you phrase your prayer. I always already talked about being respectful of the Lord, but some people will say like, oh, you know, but I don't know like the lingo and I don't know like how to... Some people, they get up and pray and they, they use the these and the thous and am I against that sort of thing? No, but there's no like right way to pray. You don't have to pray in King James English. You know, you can just pray in in a normal language, right? Just your, your everyday language. So just think about how you would talk to somebody respectfully. That's how you think you should, that's how you should pray. You know, you're just talking to God and just asking for things. Uh, what about what time of the day you pray? It doesn't matter whether you pray in the morning or whether you pray at night. People pray at all sorts of times. Ideally, you should just be praying throughout the day, you know, because you don't need to have a certain time of day, but you obviously should be praying when you're awake. You know, some people say, well, I'm going to cuddle up into bed, you know, put my eye, you know, things, that I fall, I'm going to pray just before I go to bed. And it's like, our father, <laughs> just go straight to sleep. So you probably don't want to pray like that because you probably won't end up praying, right? You probably just end up going to sleep. What about how often or how long to pray? Again, like these are just, you know, the questions of how sincere you are in your prayer. Obviously, the more sincere you are in your prayer, you may pray longer or more often for that prayer or for others. I want to show you some verses about what position to pray in. Some people say, is there a certain position to pray in? Like I said, I think there are examples in the Bible of how people prayed, but I don't think it's a commandment because I think there are all different ways people prayed in the Bible. But we do see a, a, a more gen, uh, um, a more way that people pray in the Bible, and that's like kneeling down with their hands lifted up. And I wanted to just show you some of these passages here. So in Nehemiah 8, 6, you see here, oh, but before I get into, sorry, different positions to pray, one thing is here, a lot of people, uh, I guess most of us, when we think of prayer, we think of you know, putting our hands together and bowing our heads. But what I want to show you here in Nehemiah 8 is bowing your head to pray is more associated with worshipping God than it is with prayer. We see here, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. So that's like the prayer, right? Lifting up your hands, Amen. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. First Timothy 2. So this is this lifting up of holy hands when we're praying. First Timothy 2, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So I often thought when I read this, so maybe you know, when I pray, you know, I should lift up my hands, right? You know, follow this this verse here. Um, so that's that's one thing. So I'm thinking, are people standing and lifting up their hands? You know, that's maybe one way to pray. But I think what generally people are doing here in the Bible is that they are kneeling on their knees and lifting up their hands. Because when we see here Solomon praying before the nation of Israel, it says here, for Solomon had made a brazen scaffold. Right? So he's standing up on a high platform of five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. So if you know, this is when he was dedicating the temple and he was praying 
towards God. So, you know, this is uh, you know, maybe how we should do things, but I guess old habits die hard. It's like greet the brethren with a holy kiss. That's like something I haven't been doing yet either. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't uh, plan on doing anytime soon. But uh, Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So you can see here that the kneeling down to pray is definitely something that is done in the Bible. Here's Jesus praying in the garden, right? He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. So that's how we get the saying, a stone's throw away about a stone's cast, and kneel down and pray. So this is why you know, my, at home in my, with my family, we, we would normally kneel down and we would pray. And like I said, these are, just because you see things done in the Bible, that doesn't always mean it's a commandment, right? These are just priests. Because here, I want to show you Acts 20 here. This is Paul, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them. So this is when he's gathered with the elders in Ephesus, and he's praying with them. But I'll show you some other examples of like different positions where people are praying. You know, they're not as common as the ones we just looked at, which is kneeling down, down, lifting up your hands. But Luke 18, we have the publican and the Pharisee praying. Verse 13, and the publican, look at this, standing afar off. So here he's standing, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Right? So he's looking down but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we can see here that the position of the prayer is not what validates or invalidates your prayer. This is, what, this is the main point I'm trying to get at. There's, there are different ways people pray. We can see a more general way that people pray, but the position is not going to change whether God hears your prayer, right? It's the sincerity of your heart, right? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So here's somebody standing, not lifting his eyes up. Because, you know, we sort of pray with our eyes closed. And generally you pray with your eyes closed just to free yourself from distractions. Right? But here we see the, the idea of lifting up your eyes to heaven, right? And looking up towards God, lifting up your hands. And, and you visually praying to God as well as in your heart. Look at John 17. We talked about the Lord's Prayer. Here's Jesus praying with his disciples. Right? But where is Jesus here? He's not actually kneeling down when he's praying here with his disciples. He's actually sitting at supper. He's sitting at a table. And then he prays for his disciples. And these words spake Jesus and lift, lifted up his eyes to heaven. And said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. So this Lord's Prayer in John 17 is actually John sitting at a table with his disciples, but yet he looks up and prays. So we can see here all these different positions that people pray. Really what's important, you know, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. But we can see here that the way people present themselves is representing a matter of their heart. You know, they pray to God, they leave his high lifted up, so they reach out, you know, lift up their eyes to heaven, but sometimes when they're being humble, like the publican, he wouldn't, doesn't even want to look up to God, and he smote his breast, he's standing afar off, um, afar off, you know, I guess in the temple, right, not wanting to be too close to God's presence because of, you know, how sinful he felt he was. So there we see different ways to pray, right? Now, why do we pray in Jesus' name? Well, in John 14, I, I didn't put this in my notes, but in John 14, we talk, Jesus talks about asking things in his name. And that's where the practice of finishing a prayer in Jesus' name comes from, right? Because if we ask these things in his name, then that's where we know the God, that the Father hears us, right? All right, point number four is what about fasting? Why do we fast? Right? So fasting is not something that's just done separately. Right? Like sometimes people say, like, oh, I'm just fasting, and that's just something they do just to feel spiritual or whatnot. Fasting is always accompanied with prayer because fasting is again about showing your earnest desire for your prayer to be answered, your prayer to be fulfilled. So you, you will afflict yourself 
and fast to get God's attention even more. Look at Ezra 8, verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Right? So fasting is about showing your you know, sincerity in your prayers. So what is fasting? Fasting is just to go for a period of time without food or you know, without water even. So some people do they fast liquids as well as food for the purpose of prayer. Right? It's not, you don't fast just because you want to feel spiritual. You don't fast just because you're just fulfilling a tradition. Right? Sometimes people fast up to Easter or up to Christmas. They're just fasting just because that's just a tradition that they're doing. Right? You don't want to fast just because you want to lose weight. <laughs> you know? Now, if you fast, you probably will lose some weight, but that shouldn't be your primary purpose. Some people, they, they say, I want to fast because I want to lose weight, not really because they are actually wanting to beseech God more earnestly for something. Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What is that like in today's age? Oh, I'm so tired. I'm going to headache because I'm fasting. You know? so, this is, so this is saying like when you fast, people really shouldn't know that you're fasting. It's like obvious. And it's just like, oh, so the whole world knows. You know, you know it's say, like, yeah, you want people to praise you for fasting, there's your reward, right? You're not going to get rewarded by God for fasting because you already have it. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So oftentimes prayer and fasting, there is a time for public prayer and fasting. But most of prayer and fasting is done in secret, right? You don't always know um, what people are praying for when they're fasting, right? Because there are things that are done in secret between you and God. But we see fasting is not just an Old Testament thing. Fasting is done in the New Testament too. It's something that applies to us. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them, when they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So oftentimes when they were praying for people and sending them to do a great work, it was a serious thing. They would fast and pray in these instances. The same is happening in Acts 14, 23. I'll skip over it for sake of time. 1 Corinthians 7, look at this. Defraud ye not one the other. This is talking about married couple not sleeping together, right? It says, don't defraud ye one the other, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, look at this, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So you see, fasting really is about denying yourself of fleshly pleasures. So it's not only can it be food, water, but it can also be sexual desire as well. You may say, look, I'm going to go for a time. But you can see here it's with consent, right? So ladies and men, you know, ladies maybe in particular can't just be like, no, nah, because I'm, I'm fasting, right? It has to be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for inconsistency. So that's the danger of going too long, you know, a married couple going apart is that they'll be tempted to commit fornication. So that's why we fast. Fast is about, again, afflicting yourself to show your earnestness about what you're asking for God. Now the last section I just want to talk about, we'll go over some verses quickly. Some things to pray for. Some things to pray for. Now generally, like I said, you pray for things that are outside of your control. You know, so you think about, you know, if, if you can, if you have the ability to do something, you don't really need to pray for that. 
right? You may, you may be praying for the boldness or the strength to do it, but if you can do it, if you can fulfill a need, you can help somebody. I mean, you don't have to pray that somebody's going to help somebody if you can just help them, right? So those sort of things you don't pray, things that are within your control. So what do you pray for? Generally, you pray for things outside of your control, things that you cannot control, that you are giving to God and committing to Him. But let's look at some of the things in the Bible that people pray for. And we already talked about the Lord's Prayer and got some examples from that. But these, these are examples on top of those. Ephesians 1. These are things we can pray for one another. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What is he praying for? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, and revelation in the knowledge of him. So you see how he's praying for others to understand God better. That's one thing you can pray for others in this church. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Right? So that's one thing. Pray for understanding for others. To, to, to open their eyes to spiritual things. Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So that's like, because if you didn't know, Ephesians and Colossians are known as twin epistles, right? They're like epistles that very similar topics. And if you read Ephesians with Colossians, you'll see it almost reads side by side. It's very interesting. Verse 10, but what is he else is he praying for here? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So see how we can pray for others? We pray not just for them to grow in their knowledge and understanding, but we pray for them to increase in their work, in their doing for God, right? What they do for God, increasing in the knowledge of God, being fruitful in every good work. Ephesians 6, look at this, look at what else we can pray for others. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, this is what Paul is asking for a prayer request, that utterance, what's utterance? Utter, to utter, to speak, is his ability to speak. That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel which I am an ambassador in bonds. For therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Wow, you think Paul, you know, man who's you know, all, done all the things he does, a powerful preacher, yet he is asking for boldness to preach. It just shows even the best of men are men at best, and I'm sure there were times when he was fearful to preach the gospel, and he needed boldness, just like we do. So that's, why, that's another thing we can pray for. 1 Thessalonians 1. Look at this. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the work that they're doing, the labor of love, the work that they're doing, but what's this patience of hope? This is going through the hard times, right? Patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So we can pray for people to have the patience, right, the endurance to go through trials, tribulations, and afflictions. All of us have problems, right? Struggles that we're going through. That's another thing that we can pray for for others, right? For them to have the patience and the endurance to go through those hard times. First Timothy 2. This is one we need in uh, today's day and age, right? With all this COVID and mumbo jumbo going on. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. So if you want to know how, how can we pray for our country, 
We can pray that they just leave us be, that we can just lead a Christian life quiet and peaceable in all godliness. And honestly, that's another thing to pray for. Philemon, verse 4, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So what do we want to pray for here? That the work people do would be effective. They would make a difference. That's one thing that we can pray for as well. This is what Paul is praying, you know, we're with Philemon. <coughs> and uh, Revelation 6, we'll look at a few more. Verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So what are they praying for here to God? They are asking God for vengeance on evil people, aren't they? That God would take vengeance on evil people. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. Careful here is talking about worry. So careful is not talking about, like we use the word careful to mean diligent, right? Like take care, you know, be diligent about things. Being careful here is talking about you're full of care, right? You're worried. It's saying here, be careful for nothing. You know, like the, you know that song, why worry when you can pray? I don't know if you know that song. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You know, a friend in Mexico told me, like, if you, why worry? Because if you could do something about it, you'd do something about it. So you don't have to worry. And if you can't do anything about it, you can't do anything about it. So why worry? So worry doesn't change anything anyway. So you, you never need to worry. You just need to pray. If you can't do anything about it, if you can do something about it, you do it. But that's what it's saying here. Don't worry, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So one thing we can pray for is we can cast our care onto Jesus, right? We can, things that we're worried about, we can commit to God. Right? And uh, the last thing I want to show you here, oh, two, oh, sorry, second last thing, James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the point I want to make in this passage is prayer is not just for church leaders. And you think like, you know, Victor, I want you to pray for this. Or, you know, people, and it's fine to ask people to pray for things. But what I want to show you here is prayer is the responsibility of everyone in the church. We need to be praying for one another. It's not just something that, you know, preaching may be something that is done by church leadership, right? Preaching in terms of now what you're sitting in now, but prayer isn't. Prayer, we all should be praying one for another. And the last passage in this point is we don't want our sin to hinder our prayers. Sin can hinder prayers, right? Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So this is talking about relationship between husband and wife, right? Wife submitting to the husband. Likewise, verse 7, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, right? This is how we love our wives. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So you can see how like your prayers can be hindered. How can they be hindered? They can be hindered by our sin. That's why it's always good that when we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us so we can have a clean, pure heart as we come to God because we know we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's a good idea when you pray, hey, if you have unconfessed sin, you should confess them to God so that you can, your prayers are not hindered, right? Because obviously sin in your life can hinder your prayers. So, a good idea when you think about what to pray for, if you don't already, you should keep a list, right? Because 
it's good, you know, don't rely on your memory. Right? But if you keep a list, just keep a list of things that you're praying for, and take them off when they're no longer applicable, put things on there. So when you do pray, you remember uh, things to pray for. And that's, I think that's always a very good practice. Now, just as a closing thought, last thing I want to leave you with is you know, if we pray, you know, we can have confidence that God will work in the lives of his people. And I want to just end on this passage in Philippians. I think it's always something I think about when I think about prayer because it reminds us that we can have confidence that if we pray for one another, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. And I know that's hard to believe. That's why sometimes we have to pray like, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. But I want to show you here the confidence of Paul as he prayed for the Philippians and why he had that confidence that God will work in their life because he was praying for them. Look what he says here in Philippians 1.3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, why is, it, why is he confident that Jesus is going to work in the lives of the Philippians? Even as it is meet, what is it suitable for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart? So just consider that, guys. I just think it's a very powerful thought that often we don't pray enough for one another. And just think about how much of a difference in somebody else's life you might make if you took the time to pray for them. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. So I just want to leave you with that thought, is your prayers make a difference. So make sure you know, we're praying for one another, if you don't know what to pray for, you can ask people, you know, what do you want me to pray for? And keep a list so that you don't forget. Write it down. You know, all of us have phones now. You know, just put it in the reminders app or write a note. Just, just write a list and you have your prayer requests notes in your phone. And that will be all that. If you don't know them, you can click on the link in TMAP. That goes to our church's prayer requests. You can fill in some of those and put those on your list as well. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you. Uh, Lord, that we have this privilege of prayer, that we can come to you and we can um, you know, come before your presence and have this privilege because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just thank you, Lord. Help us to understand this privilege that we have. And Lord, help us to pray for one another. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.